Well, I want to thank uh, Brett and the Globecom team for inviting uh, me to sit on the panel and for their hospitality over the last couple of days. And uh, so I wanted to really kind of go through um, our implementation of uh, 4G and what we're doing. And um, it's really on the uh, fixed wireless only. So when I hear Ryan talk about operating four different networks, uh, 2G, 3G, and two 4G networks, I'm a little bit uh, envious of that. Uh, we've got a very simplistic uh, network compared to his, where we've just got uh, one um, slice of spectrum, 700 megahertz, and we're doing uh, fixed wireless uh, on it only. So Adams has been around uh, as a telephone cooperative for, for 60 some years. Uh, we've been in the wireless uh, industry really uh, since early on doing paging, uh, uh, IMTS, which is the uh, original mobile telephone system, uh, ITFS, that was mentioned uh, this morning, and we were doing that off of a spectrum lease from the schools. Uh, the schools had access to uh, certain portions of the ITFS uh, spectrum. So in the early 90s, before DBS, uh, direct broadcast satellite really uh, came of age. Uh, we were offering 20 channels of uh, wireless cable TV, and that was a very um, popular product for us. And then from uh, 2001 till uh, 2012, uh, we had a 2G network, 2.5G, because it was operating uh, uh, edge data. We had 60-some sites, uh, 10,000 subs, and, uh, and then last year we sold our spectrum to, uh, to U.S. Cellular. And then uh, the bottom bullet point really is the one that's a good segue to uh, our new product, um, which uh, we've been in the fixed wireless internet using unlicensed spectrum uh, really for the last 10 years as well. So um, uh, that was really uh, one of our uh, most uh, popular products even to this day. And our CFO tells us it's also one of the, our most uh, profitable uh, ventures as well. Um, but as the uh, unlicensed uh, wireless technology uh, really became mature and then uh, and antiquated, we you know were facing several challenges. We were a victim of our own success. We had a ton of users attached to uh, all these different sites, and uh, and so the the uh, lot lot of oversaturation and slow bandwidth again because of just the number of users that we were able to sell off a given uh, uh, sector. Uh, the spectrum is. Uh, unlicensed, uh, 900 megahertz, and it's prone to interference. Uh, we've got some uh, really good war stories at Adams on baby monitors and cordless telephones causing interference with our, uh, with our base stations. Uh, so obviously moving to uh, a licensed spectrum to protect that is, uh, you know, is, is very beneficial. We, um, we just had an incident last year where our uh, sales director uh, paid a, uh, a resident a uh, hundred dollars to give up their baby monitor so he could go buy a different frequency because guess what it was it was it was interfering he lives lived right close to one of our base stations so we've uh, we've paid customers off and uh, I mean there there's there's a half a dozen examples where we've done that as well um, another disadvantage is the vendor's equipment is proprietary so the cost of the uh, user gear is, is high and um, and uh, so uh, there really wasn't an ecosystem since it was proprietary too. And then, of course, it was just old generation, 10 years old. A lot of the black, uh, back planes was, uh, you know, shared across uh, 200 users. You could only do two megabits through the back plane. And, and the average unlicensed uh, wireless uh, speed was probably two or 300K. And then at the same time, all these other mobile uh, carriers were coming out with their own 3G and uh, 4G product. So uh, we, uh, we've got lower C block, uh, 700 megahertz. Uh, second bullet point there is uh, David Fritz, who we used to use as a consultant before he went to Alcatel Lucent. He was talking about in the early auction in 2003, the FCC auction uh, 49, that um, he was aware of people being able to buy CMA licenses for the price of a pickup. Well, we didn't weren't able to buy our market area for the price of a pickup. Uh, so the analogy I use is we are able to pick it up for the price of a John Deere combine. And um, 
And then we, uh, Adams, entered into the 2008 auction, and all those licenses went for seven figures, and we were out after the uh, first round of bidding. So that the, the, the first auction, um, you know, very beneficial from a price standpoint, but it's also not subject to any uh, uh, build-out requirements that a lot of the later auction uh, uh, winners have to do. So, uh, uh, you know, the good news is we got it cheap. Uh, the bad news is uh, we had to sit on it uh, from 2003 until just last year, mainly due to the DTV, uh, DTV transition. And uh, not that it mattered anyway, because of an operator our size, we really didn't have many LTE options anyway. So, uh, uh, you know, we bought on it, we sat on it, had to pay the government, you know, that's the time we bought it and they used our money for the you know, six or eight years before we were able to use it. Uh, so we are an operator in Western Illinois. We bought two CMAs. <coughs> uh, I've got a map up there in a second we can look at. But uh, we talked about this this morning, the advantages of 700 megahertz uh, spectrum. It's got great propagation uh, coverage uh, characteristics. When we operated our symmetry cellular business, we were at 1.9 gig. And I, that was all about just limited coverage and and really with a 700 uh we we've got we've got customers today that are nine and a half miles from the cell site so it's really about loading it up with ca uh, capacity and coverage is definitely not an issue with 700 megahertz and of course my baby monitor example there when obviously using license spectrum you're uh, you're protected from that and then the uh, the strong ecosystem i think one of my surprises so far is uh, is there there is not a lot of ecosystem at the user equipment yet. Um, in fact, when we uh, struck our deal with Globcom a, a couple of years ago, um, really there was only one UE vendor uh, that we're utilizing today. So I, I think the ecosystem will get there, but right now it seems to be uh, a little bit more limited than I, than I thought it would be. And so uh, you see the, the, the uh, Mississippi River uh, snaking down the uh, uh, left-hand side of the map. We've got two CMAs, it's 20-some counties, and it's uh, 401,000 uh, license pops. So we're using Globecom. Um, I, this uh, slide came, I plagiarized it from a, a training session we did with our employees, so had to tell everybody where uh, 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 Long Island was at and knew we, uh, who Globecom was. <laughs> In fact, I still don't know how to say uh, ha hapag. Hapag. Okay. Okay. Should have should have done that before I uh, uh, presentation. Uh, on the on the RAN side, we're doing uh, Ericsson E Node Bs and uh, Bandrich on the user equipment. We're also looking at BEC very closely at this point. And then uh, again, we're fixed wireless only. But I do think uh, we're going to look at the USB modems, the dongles, and eventually. Uh, introduce mobility into our network. So this is a diagram with a Globecom on the left-hand side and then our own infrastructure um, on the right. I've got a couple other uh, uh, things that explain that maybe a little bit better. Uh, really, we're one of the first providers, I think, to use, I'm still calling it, uh, a hosted hybrid model where the CPG is uh, located at our facility. That was a huge advantage for us uh, because we're already an ISP and we've got two gigabits of bandwidth up to the upstream uh, providers. And so instead of backhauling all that uh, to Globecom, the CPG gives us the uh, ability to offload all that traffic. So even though it's a Globecom uh, product, we have a CPG that's uh, located in Quincy, Illinois at our data center. And uh, uh, again, it reduces our uh, operating expenses uh, tremendously. And in fact, uh, between the E-Node Bs and the CPG back to Globecom's core, we're doing that over the open internet. Uh, IP, in my opinion, is, is uh, more robust than even a lot of the TDM that's out there today. So uh, any, any uh, uh, registration of the device, uh, any signaling that goes on, is uh, done over the open internet, and so we really have no backhaul cost to, to Globecom. So for a small carrier uh, with us, I think there was a slide this morning saying there's 100 million uh, connected devices. Uh, currently, we have 473 of those connected devices out there, and so uh, so uh, uh, cheap backhaul is, is important to us. 
Uh, this is an example uh, of the bandwidth router that we're using. Again, we're also looking uh, very closely at BEC. And then I think there's a third vendor out there, AccessTel, that will also have a fixed uh, device solution uh, probably this fall. Okay, so for us, uh, how we got there to the pre-launch phase, our challenges before then, is uh, we were really the first one, I think, to deploy with Globecom and their CPG product. Uh, on the RAN side, uh, long lead times uh, for the E node Bs. Um, for a small company like us, and Ryan could probably attest to this, we pride ourselves on being very flexible and quick to market. And so when you're, uh, uh, you know, when, when you have to wait uh, six to nine months to deploy a cell site, uh, that may be more typical in the larger environment for us. That's a, that's a long time for make a decision and then roll it out and launch it. And then again, I mentioned uh, uh, the UE, the number of, uh, limited number of choices for fixed wireless right now. Also designing a package for our, uh, our customers, our wireless customers for uh, pricing and data cap. So we've done fixed wireless for 10 years. We've never had a data cap uh, until now. So it was a real challenge for us internally to discuss uh, what the best package was. And, and again, going back to some comments early this morning, um, you know, we're not doing two gigs or four gigs. If everybody's doing streaming uh, video, you're gonna have to really increase uh, your caps. In fact, we start ours at 15. Uh, our, our standard one is, is 30 gigabytes and we have them all the way up, I think, to 200 right now. So we, uh, we've really tried to uh, concentrate on what the best package size is. And then another, uh, another interesting discussion that we always have at Adams is when to call, when is enough for system utilization? How many customers can we add to a site in a sector? Um, what are the download and upload speeds that you know, keep us comparable with the competition, but also without wrecking the network? And then, um, um, again, with uh, 700 propagation, um, you know, how far out can we add customers? Uh, we're, we're doing uh, a few hundred customers that are in between seven and nine miles with a fixed uh, Yagi antenna. And then um, this is one of the things that uh, Brett and I were talking about a few weeks ago is when the system's live, uh, what resources are available to us to be able to <laughs> you know, operate our network and, uh, and grow our network. And really, I think there's two key uh, tools that's uh, provided with our overall solution with Globecom. So we use uh, th their Telsasoft OSS for alarm and performance uh, KPIs. I've got one slide showing an example of that. And then the, uh, the deep packet inspection is probably our single most important tool for uh, really just monitoring the network. Uh, we use it for traffic shaping and policing. And then we also use it uh, just to understand what the customers are doing you know, to our network. And after we, uh, you know, we've, we've gone live, what are the customers doing on our network? Uh, well, guess what? Video streaming is by far the uh, uh, leading user of bandwidth. Uh, you'll see this is a one-day snapshot of about 450 customers on the network. YouTube, uh, 81 gig. Netflixing, 24. Xbox, so on and so forth. Um, and so it, it's unbelievable. Uh, we had heard a year ago, we were guessing that 50% of the traffic would be video streaming. I really think it's closer to 75%. Uh, not only because those applications are popular, but also, of course, because they take up you know, a ton of bandwidth. And this is a snapshot straight off the uh, Procera DPI tool, by the way. Uh, one of the things we've uh, really been fighting with is uh, these video streaming providers are really good with these adapt adaptive streaming protocols and they're really hard to enforce. When we first started playing with our DPI, and, uh, and Gopi and uh, Nardine helped us out and continue to help us out, is uh, if you, uh, if you uh, let Netflix uh, stream um, how they want to stream and you uh, keep uh, user equipment uh, wide open and don't limit the speeds, they'll push about 14 mega traffic down to the device 
and to your cash, and then let the uh, uh, and then based upon that, they'll limit that. So, so if you're watching the DPI, you'll see a, a Netflix movie stream about 14 megabits a second, and then once it catches up, it'll stream to one or two megabits, and then you'll watch the DPI and it'll go up to six or eight megabits. So they're always uh, trying to you know get ahead of the uh, any potential uh, restriction in the network. And um, one of the things we did is uh, we limp, tried to limit uh, Netflix uh, um, and really all video services to a certain speed. But these adaptive streaming pro protocols are really interesting because if you uh, limit, again, I'll just use Netflix as the example, um, them to like four megabits per second, within a couple of minutes, they can understand that you're trying to limit one protocol and they can deliver it through, uh, in the, the case we were looking at, was HTTP traffic. So you try to limit their main protocol to four megabits and within a couple of minutes again, they're, uh, they're delivering that same video stream over HTTPD and back up to 14 megabits. So we, we spent a lot of time on trying to make sure that, uh, that these video streaming vendors uh, are really trying to, uh, we really want to make that an efficient use of, uh, of our wireless network. So I, that's one of a big, uh, been a big challenge. And then uh, uh, I think there's a couple other uh, wireless service providers in our area that are actually limiting uh, Netflix to uh, standard definition. We let them have an HD stream, which is about four megabytes. But you know, you look at all the uh, technologies coming down the road as far as Ultra HD and 3D and whatever. We're just really interested in uh, with uh, wireless being a finite resource. Um, you know, when can a wireless network, or at least the one that Adams intends to deploy, you know, when is enough? So not only is video the number one. Uh, uh, you know, user uh, of bandwidth on our network. Another thing we're finding is our, our customers love the ability of what 4G can do to build the ability to download a lot of data. So again, this is a snapshot from August the 1st, and we've got one, uh, one customer that did uh, 29 gigabits of traffic. That's in one day. And then you've got everybody else. Um, these are the top, uh, the top 10 users. Um, What's neat about the uh, DPI uh, is you can really get granular. Uh, I think it's one of the third or fourth users. I was drilling down to him. I don't have any screenshots on that. But he was, uh, he's a big uh, MLB.TV fan. And not only can you tell that he was streaming off MLB TV, you can go down even at a more granular basis and figure out what games he was watching. In this case, he's in Quincy, Illinois, and he was watching a lot of Cincinnati Reds games. And so that just kind of shows you the power of the DPI and how it really helps you understand, uh, you know, customer habits. Before you switch, the blue is uplink, right? The blue is uplink. You notice those guys are also uplink abusers. Yeah. And, uh, can you grab, a, can you grab a mic, please? Grab a mic. Nope. Nobody else is using uplink at all, basically. Right. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's much more than 10 to 1. It's usually, it's usually 20 to 1. Right. But my point is, whoever these guys are, they've also got upstream activity going on, so they're not just watching something. Uh, we don't know exactly unless your DPI is aware of what they're doing. It's way oh. more than VoIP. Yeah. yeah. I think so. I and, think so. And, and, and not just Facebook. And, and we, we market to a lot of businesses too, so uh, the, you know we, we uh, it could be uh, could be that most of that uh, uh, the, the strong uplink users are are indeed smaller smaller medium businesses. Another interesting like observation and really a challenge for us is um, the way uh, our RAN vendor um, sells us that they've got a licensing component that uh, on the number of connected users. And we were kind of basing our model on 250 users per site, or roughly 80 per sector. But of the 250, only half of those would be active during the busy hour. Well, instead of 50%, what we're finding is it's 100%, uh, or at least 95%. 
So uh, the third one, fourth one down, South Quincy, we've got 175 uh, peak UEs in the connected mode during the busy hour. Guess how many customers we show on that site? It's between 175 or 180. So it's a, it's a, it's. There's so many applications uh, behind the uh, the bandwidth device that are keeping the connections on, uh, open. So um, we, uh, you know, we're estimating behind the bandwidth device. There's anywhere from three to five devices. By some estimates, that's even conservative. So uh, usually there's a laptop in the house. Uh, it's either a hardwired PC, desktop, or it's actually a laptop. Uh, there's one gaming platform. There's, there's one to two tablets. Uh, there's one to two handheld devices, either a smartphone or an iPod. All those are always constantly pinging the network uh, for weather updates, uh, you know, uh, sports updates or whatever. And, uh, and another, um, facet of the really the DPI reporting is that this uh, this is a single I, uh, user and these are the uh, just the number of uh, TCP connections he's got open the point is each one of these in just a matter of a few seconds will constantly be pinging the network so um, um, you really have to pay attention to, uh, so, so for us, we're going back to our RAN vendor and having to buy a few more connected user license and uh, because there's, you know, it's an always on, constant connection and uh, there, there's so many apps behind the, uh, the device that it's, uh, it's, it's really amazing. It, it, that's probably uh, one of the design components that's really what caught us surprise is that every device is, uh, is attached during the uh, busy hour. And then uh, uh, real quickly, and I guess uh, uh, in conclusion, uh, we're, we're doing uh, external antennas for 90% of our installs. One of the main reasons for that is, uh, is we're doing a lot of technology migration at Adams. So we're actually using this 4G product to replace a wired broadband solution that we've had in our, uh, in our ILUC area for about 10 years. It's an old uh, SHDSL uh, protocol where uh, four users uh, share one and a half meg of uh, uh, bandwidth. So it's it's kind of ironic that again, in in, in small atoms uh, telephone, uh, we're replacing our wired product, our wired broadband product, with a wireless uh, uh, replacement technology. So, um, so really, um, we've got several hundred of these users that uh, require external antennas because they're uh, very long uh, loops. They're you know roughly seven to nine miles. And another thing that we've uh, we've done is uh, we've actually used the bandrich UE as more of a front end or air interface. We keep the existing customer router, which is a wi usually a Wi-Fi router, in place, and we just tie the two of them together with an Ethernet cable, and then that allows the technician uh, doing the truck roll, they don't have to uh, go in and change all the Wi-Fi devices behind, all, uh, behind everything uh, but behind the existing router. So we're actually doing a, a, a pretty unique application where we're tying uh, two devices together. And then... Uh, uh, really, uh, what we're finding also is wireless uh, is a finite resource. I think uh, uh, the fact that we've only got a single uh, C block, uh, five up and five down, we're especially limited. It's one of the questions I've got, you know, for Kerry and the 600 megahertz auction that's coming down the road, is if they can parse that out in uh, in bigger chunks because the uh, because five up and five down with no other spectrum assets that we've got, it's, it's, it's pretty limited right now for us, especially with our plan to, uh, you know, allow as much video streaming service on our network, you know, as the network itself will, will permit. And then uh, another thing, um, we, um, depending on the time of day, downlink and uplink speeds vary greatly. Um, and so, it, and a lot of that's just, uh, uh, you know, just uh, an example of how much traffic is on the network. And then uh, 
still, um, you know, and our, our, our experience with Globecom has been very positive. This initial trial that we're doing with these 475 customers has been very, very positive. Um, even if they complain about varying speeds, to the majority of our customers, they came from an old technology that was only allowing a couple of hundred K per second. Now they're getting eight megabytes per second. And to them, uh, you know, that, that is such a, a positive experience. And then that also allows uh, Adams to, uh, you know, grow its network and, and gain more revenue. So, so overall, it's been a, a very, you know, positive thing. Very good. Thank you. So why are you only a fixed LT provider? When, uh, so again, a subsidiary of ours, uh, Adams uh, Telecom, owned a Symmetry Wireless. Um, we uh, ceased operations after we sold our spectrum uh, to US Cellular about 14 uh, months ago. So we really had no other assets to launch. Um, you know, true mobility type service. So we ha had no other fallback. So our only spectrum ac a um, asset was um, 700. And for a small player like us, even though uh, with Globecom, you know, you, we, you know, you can do Volte and, you know, that's the road they want to head down. But for so us. So you're saying you're not doing voice is basically We're not doing voice. Okay. We are testing voice over the top. Uh, just using our internal uh, uh, soft switch that we've got there, but just by the nature of our our limited, uh, you know, spectrum, that was really our only. Uh, so you don't think there's a market for mobile uh, broadband as opposed to having a voice anchor? Now, do you mean uh, mobility as being uh, so you uh, you've got dongles? Smart? Everybody has MiFi's and dongles that would allow you to support mobile data, mobile broadband customers, wherever they are, not just at their house where you have a fixed location, you know where they are, but yeah. having people who want to, you know, use their service wherever they are in your coverage area. I, I think we'll get down, uh, get, get there. I think part of the challenges is still the limited uh, ecosystem. And uh, plus, I showed a picture of the, uh, the Bandrich router, their, uh, their dongle uh, that they offer is even it, it's probably 30 percent more expensive than their uh, their ue to their their fixed device too so even introducing mobility onto the network even if it's an option adams has about 7500 um, broadband customers so we've got an opportunity in my opinion to sell uh, mobility service even if it's within our own network to those 7500 customers um, but you know we're we're still early in uh, we're, we're still calling this the pilot project. Uh, you know I'm working with uh, Ken and Brett on the aspects of the pilot project. So we're this is like our first significant step into the market, and I, I think eventually we'll get there with mobility. And I think a year or two down the road, you know we're going to look at all of our options to to best utilize the spectrum. Okay, so uh, Sheridan Valley Wireless. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we do um, and. Uh, uh, Tim, if you'd be more than happy to run that for me. Sheraton Valley Wireless, we actually started out as Sheraton Valley Cellular in April of uh, 1991. We were a charter member for RCA, which is now uh, CCA. Uh, we had AMPS back in 93, and in 1998, we changed our name to Sheraton Valley Wireless. Um, in 99, we rolled out TDMA. 05, we rolled out GSM. In uh, 2012, we launched uh, uh, fixed wireless for CDMA and we went live with a mobile product uh, for CDMA on the 16th of July 2012. Two months later we uh, launched a 4G network and we're currently uh, um, uh, testing our um, what we call our CV 4G network which is to uh, go commercially live third, qu third quarter of this year. So uh, uh, some other information about uh, our organization. We've pretty much been in a hosting uh, arrangement um, from the get-go. Uh, we hosted uh, with a company called Minmo Cellular for amps. Uh, we did have a little stint where we had a 5E switch, and it was called an ECP switch that we did a little bit of our TDMA switching. Um, we did have Ericsson host us back uh, in the day. Uh, we were with Perio Solutions at one time, and uh, I've told this story to Brett. 
uh, we were at uh, RCA one one year, and my general manager said, "Let's go talk to Globecom." And I'm like, "Who the hell is that?" <laughs> I, don't, I didn't want to change, but uh, in the end, we ended up changing to Globecom. And, and uh, the reason why we went uh, with Globecom is because uh, they could provide us with GSM, CDMA, and, and uh, 4G down the road as well. So uh, we made a decision back in 2011 that we were going to go all in on wireless. Uh, we're an ILEC and a CLEC. Uh, we're our ISP, local landline service. Uh, we do IPTV and we do wireless. So um, I went through it. We deployed a 3G. Um, we uh, signed up as a Verizon LRA uh, participant. And uh, we are um, working on deploying our... Uh, um, we talk about the reason why we uh, went hosted versus uh, buying our own core. Obviously, uh, some advantages were some lower cap and OPEX, um, the switches off site, and uh, I just can't find some talent in north central Missouri to operate a switch. So, uh, you know, um, some, you know, disadvantages, um, you know, additional staff required, there's a limited talent pool, a large backhaul pipe needed, and, um, you know, Globcom takes care of all the software upgrades. So when we talk about deploying uh, a network, um, I have a very good project manager that works for me. Um, I know it's kind of misleading my title. It's actually director of sales and marketing, and I have all of the wireless underneath my umbrella. But I have a project manager that works for me, and she manages all products, projects across the company, not just wireless, but for our ILEC and our CLEC as well. But um, uh, it was very uh, uh, important that when we went down the CMA path that um, we were going to be reaching out to the OEM uh, vendors that we really hadn't contacted before because we needed to write a PRI for our phones. So we had to contact uh, Motorola, Samsung, LG, HTC, and Banrich. And uh, um, when you're a little guy, getting a hold of these people is not easy. So they kind of brush you off. But uh, we were successful in writing a PRI, which is uh, specifically how uh, um, the, the configuration for a CDMA phone and we had to learn how to write that and then we also had to write a preferred roaming list which is a prl which uh puts the order of uh the roaming uh, partners in order for the phone some of the other challenges we had um we were deploying the 3g network at the same time we were also building a 4g network and i've got some uh, network pictures i'll show you um so for the Entire year of 2012, I uh, didn't take a vacation because I was uh, so uh, involved in the project. Um, we were a GSM provider before, but uh, we had to learn how to use card admin from Jamalto. Um, and then being an LRA participant, our phones had to fall back from 4G LTE to 3G, um, which we learned about the CSIM portion of the, of the SIM card. I did put some marketing stuff in here uh, to kind of show you what we do, but uh, we do a lot of direct mail. Um, we, uh, we do a bundle uh, high-speed uh, internet and phone um, together. And uh, um, when we, you can go to the next one, Tim. When we actually bundle this, we get really good results uh, from this, uh, this direct mail piece. Our stores get very busy and, and uh, uh, um, the, the salespeople like the, uh, uh, the attention they get. A billboard, we put this billboard up uh, in one of our markets and uh, the customer just went crazy. Uh, we offered a, an introductory price and uh, uh, $19.95 for the first three months and after that it went up to the $49.95. We went out to, uh, uh, I spent Saturdays and Sundays sticking up yard signs. Uh, actually uh, stuck them in one of our uh, ILEC, uh, um, uh, one of our, uh, another cooperative and kind of got a call back on that. So. You have to watch what we do there. Uh, our network. The other, the other thing is, is uh, um, when we were GSM, we all of our BSC, um, um, we have a, a, a Nokia BSC and we had a, a, an Ericsson BSC, but um, all of our equipment was in the, the shelter below the site. So uh, when we look at our market, we have 45 sites up in what's uh, um, our Mo5 market. Uh, we have GSM deployed on 42 of those 45. And we have CDMA deployed on 45 of the 45. Um, we have one of those 45 that's running 1900 um, as a license saver. Um, and then our LRA is on 45 of our 45 sites. And um, our lower um, CV 4G is on four of those sites right now. And uh, um, we own all of the towers but one of these. 
So when we decided we were going to deploy um, our 4G network, we have 24 megahertz of BNC license. We selected four towns to do it. Um, this was strategic for us because we were gonna go after some competitors in the market. And we selected these four towns um, and we were gonna market them um, with a high speed wireless internet. So our cell sites, uh, you can see 31 of them use fiber optics, which is our own fiber optics network. 12 of them use microwave and two of them we uh, use copper. Uh, obviously, we have uh, our sites backed up to a, a generator, uh, 40, 36 of our 45 cell sites. You can see here our network, this is kind of the way our network's made up. We have a Cisco ME3400 switch that um, back calls our 3G and 4G traffic back to our network operation center. And um, you can see the, the LRA E node B and then our lower um, CB E node B. That, on the right was what I just showed you. That on the left handles all the GSM. So it's rather large. We uh, also decided when we were uh, um, gonna deploy a 3G network that we were gonna go with tower top radios, which scared the hell out of our wireless network manager. It was a decision we made. Uh, we, don't, we didn't have a tower climber at all, but um, you can see here that uh, this is the configuration of our um, network um, prior to our launch of our 4G network. We have CDMA, we have LRA, and we have GSM. You can see the uh, tower top radios there at the top. And when you go to the next slide, we changed out the antennas to a dual pole 850 and we put up um, an antenna for our lower 700. At, at the same time, when we do that, we put up additional uh, three, uh, three more radios at the top. So this is just some pictures of the top of our towers that are taken. This is a uh, lightning, uh, outdoor lightning protection unit that we use uh, that was placed at the top of the tower. And we use a power fiber cable up the tower. That's an Ericsson Eno B. And then we take these pictures just uh, obviously for a uh, um, quality check to make sure that the uh, tower technicians are doing their job and everything's weatherproofed. This is actually a look at one of our towers. Um, uh, you can see that the uh, bottom radios are our uh, CDMA network and the top radios are our uh, 4G network. If we have uh, a site such as this that requires lower 700, there'll be three more additional radios. So it gets pretty busy up top. This is just another look at it. So we, uh, uh, you know, we, we've been pretty busy as a company because we, we did install, you know, um, we do have four networks that, that, we, um, that we currently, you know, have up online uh, every day. And uh, um, our lower 700 is exactly, uh, we have the same setup as uh, Adam's telephone uh, where we're going after a fixed wireless, same CPG comes right back to Globecom. We're an ISP, so we dump it out our ISP pipe uh, locally from the CBG. But we have the same, uh, uh, basically the same network, same RAN. We're the same as Adams uh, in, in our lower. So again, we have a chance for some Q&A. Um, I'm gonna try and prime the pump here, so I'm relying on you to come behind me, okay? Um, I wanna think about how you develop networks over time. Um, I'm going to throw things into two categories and tell me if it applies to you at all, okay? One I will describe as an overlay strategy and the other I will describe as a, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use the sprint term, network vision strategy, where you look back and you say, well, you know, the old equipment I have supporting these previous networks is power consuming, is uh, sitting on taking a lot of real estate, and I could shrink it down to a sh I could shrink it down to a much more manageable footprint. Do you ever think about the replacement versus overlay, and how that trade-off would look? Do you, as you build your new network, do you look back and say, let me replace the networks I had, particularly since there are multi-mode base stations now that could easily allow you to just use a shelf, right? Just use a... Uh, there are. Uh, we actually uh, have some multi-mode um, um, 
BBCs or BBUs um, in our network. But um, when we look at uh, our legacy systems, for example, like GSM, um, this was a conversation we've with we've had with Globecom as to when do we pull the plug on our GSM network and. Uh, quite frankly, it's hard for us to pull the plug on GSM right now because it, AT&T only has four towers in our market, so they rely on us uh, for GSM uh, coverage. coverage. Uh, until that coverage becomes, uh, or the revenue becomes, uh, you know, dried up, we'll continue to operate our GSM network. Um, as we do, we just continue to take carriers away from it um, to add them to the CDMA, uh, the network. But we constantly are looking at our network to see where we can improve it. Um, we're constantly drive testing our network uh, to see where we can make improvements in the network. But most certainly, I mean, uh, I'm concerned um, about, you know, you seeing the tower. Um, we, uh, I think Carrie asked this morning how many people named their Spectrum and we kept, when she, I think everybody else stopped and I kept mentioning stuff because um, as we have some Spectrum, we'd sell them um, for some John Deere combines. Um, but it has to be a lot of them. The, uh, uh, the other thing is, is, you know, we have AWS Spectrum. So this morning's panel, when we're talking about, you know, uh, capacity, um, if uh, capacity becomes an issue for us, I can put up AWS in those four towns, and I've just provided myself with additional capacity. Now, if I tell my wireless network manager that, he's going to say, well, where am I going to put it? And I really don't know, and that's not my problem. That's his. What, what percentage of your revenues come from customers that are your subscribers versus roaming subscribers? Well, for us, uh, a huge uh, portion of our revenue comes from Roamer right, right now. So more than half. Uh, more than half. More than half, right? More than half, which is scary. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, no, I, ours is about 55%. Yeah, it's more um, than half. But what we're doing with, uh, with that in mind, uh, we have grown, we have, you know, been, you know our revenue has been growing and growing and growing uh, because of the, uh, the fixed wireless product. And because uh, we're very aware that at some point the, the uh, revenue may, may go away, um, especially from AT&T. And do you have a ratio like that? Well, again, with our play being very limited compared to uh, Sheraton Valley's, um, you know, we, we don't have any roaming traffic. That's something we're looking at uh, closely since uh, really the spectrum that we own in our area is what AT&T would be uh, exactly. using to roll out in lower C. So that's one of our, um, you know, real key uh, strategies uh, down the road. Is, uh, is 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 really looking at the roaming piece very closely because uh, uh, a lot of people that we talk to just expect for AT and T to come to us at some point with some sort of RAN sharing agreement or spectrum sharing agreement uh, since we kind of kind of took the lower sea away from them in in our on our side of the river. Uh, Ryan's on the uh, on the western side of uh, the Mississippi and we're on the eastern. But it doesn't necessarily have to wait until they come to you, right? No, you can you can reach out to them, or more importantly, you can just build out and be ready to take their roaming traffic, right? Provided they'll talk to you. Exactly. Right. Yep. yep. And I know uh, you know Kerry speaks a lot of that at the RTG uh, uh, things that uh, you know we've got some visibility to, and that's that's one of the key things that we're um, you know trying to keep our eyes on. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're also doing um, with our lower 700 is. Uh, in these four towns that I, I uh, showed up there, um, we're actually doing an edge out. So we're actually going out and we're going to select these towns. Um, uh, the device we're using is similar to Tim's, um, where we can actually uh, um, uh, home that device back to our meta switch, right. and we can provide our customers with voice. Um, but more importantly, the biggest market that uh, that I see um, for this particular application is we sell a lot of hosted PBX. So we can go into some of our smaller towns and offer these customers a hosted PBX solution off of our meta switch and really go after the business customers. Yeah, I'm cherry picking, but that's exactly what I want to do. Because those customers are going to, those business customers are going to use that network during the day when usage demand is lower than the evening. And it's the same thing on our ISP. You know, when you think about our ISP, there's peaks and valleys. 
And as marketers, um, I have to figure out how to, to, to sell that valley. And, uh, you know, we're looking at doing time of day where uh, from eight to five for a business will double your, double your speed. Sure. Um, we're not out any additional cost. We're still paying for the bandwidth. So how can we generate additional revenue? Do you guys cover any shopping malls? Uh, currently, um, we, uh, we, we don't, uh, with our next phase of deployment with Ericsson, we'll be uh, launching a site uh, uh, right next to the uh, Quincy Mall, which is, uh, uh, you know, kind of the center of uh, the market area, and uh, again, on our side of the river. So mm -hmm. we're, we're right there. And are you looking to serve them with macro or uh, small cells? Really, everything we've done with uh, Ericsson up to this point has been macro cell. Uh, we we did have their team in on March the first, and uh, and you know I know they're rolling out some um, uh, micro cell stuff uh, third and fourth quarter of this year, and and uh, we uh, we don't want to be uh, leading edge or bleeding edge, but I I think small cell strategy, uh, Wi-Fi offload, you know all that's gonna. Um, really p uh, play into our strategy, especially being a CLEC, and this is where Ryan and I have some, uh, you know, a, a commonalities. When you're an ILEC and a CLEC, and you've got a lot of the infrastructure to even provide, um, you know, backhaul uh, to your own wireless towers. I think that's a that's a real key asset. Sure. And um, I, I was at a, a vendor uh, meeting last year, and the CEO talked about something how the future is all about wireless, but it's really about the fiber or backhaul infrastructure to get to those wireless sites. And, uh, you know, his uh, definition of the future was more and more um, it'll be defined on a smaller number of users per antenna. And I think that's where, uh, you know, Wi-Fi really fits in. So at a macro cell level, we're planning on 250 users per site. Um, you get down to a small cell that might be 40 or 50 users uh, per site, and you get down to a Wi-Fi model where you're, you know, talking about a dozen you know, or, or so users less. So, so for us, deploying uh, and using our own infrastructure uh, assets, uh, I think uh, we're really keen to the model of, uh, of a small selling because uh, um, in our market areas, we're going to be the backhaul. You know, one company is going to be feeding uh, one subsidiary of Adams is going to be benefiting the other, and vice versa. Does that apply to you at all? We really don't have any shopping malls in our area. Well, I only chose I only chose shopping malls as an example of a venue, which aggregates a lot of people at one place and shops and whatever could be. You know. Uh, yeah, it's a big high school. Us. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Could be could be something that you know requires a different approach to coverage that you don't provide today. That your macros aren't. aren't we, the right we've model. looked at um, actually. We have three pico cells that we have that um, we're you know playing around with to see if we could use them in that type of application. So you know, office park could be anything. Right. Uh, I don't really want to dictate it. I'm just trying to throw out examples of where small cells might be applicable. And uh, I'm also trying to segue to Andy here so that we have something in common to talk about. But um, I guess the last point is looking, looking forward, uh, if the next wave of spectrum does create opportunity, how do you see yourselves participating? Are you going to go solo? Is there a way to, to pool resources? Is there a way to create a more regional approach? <coughs> Once we sell our other 700 to him, we'll have a lot of money. Thanks, Ryan. I'll, we'll be following up with the conversation. The, the John Deere combine analogy really, uh, really took hold. Well, I but, mean, it uh, could be, you know, a seven-player deal that uh, moves some uh, guys from, you know, free agents from one team to the other, too, you know. If you can't use your assets, you may as well give them to somebody else who's well, an independent yeah. race. We, we actually, uh, the, we, we own quite a bit of spectrum. Um, because we wanted to keep the big guys out of our market, so right. we paid dearly for the mm -hmm. the the seven hundred we bought um, on the on the last one. So uh, you know, uh, we'll uh, we'll analyze what spectrum we need, and I'm sure we'll participate in the next auction to keep uh, AT&T and Verizon out. I mean, that's we it's it's a must for us. 
and it, that's really going to be a way for a lot of us uh, smaller carriers to be able to buy into the market is collectively and just not you know individually too so uh I think uh, just just the examples that I gave uh, previously, where uh, you know, 10 years ago, 700 megahertz went for X, and then the later auction went for you know this much. Oh, yeah. It's you know it's it's uh, spectrum's definitely at a premium, and you know we can only wonder what a 600 megahertz spectrum auction's going to you know bring revenue wise. So you know, is a small company like Adams going to be able to uh, you know to uh, to afford uh, um, you know 400,000 covered pop spectrum license uh, where really we're our center of interest is only three or four you know counties the only way we're going to be able to do that is collaborate with uh, you know with uh, our fellow companies but even there so far you've allowed Verizon to own the spectrum and then you are part of their program right Verizon, yeah. oh you are yeah. so in a way you don't mind yielding uh, we'll yield to a certain point um, to get you know uh, to get what we need and the reason the, the biggest reason why we joined the LRA program was purely because we could get into a 4G arena and we could offer our customers a 4G product nationwide immediately yeah. um, but also I knew that moving even though moving from GSM to CMA is not a popular move um, because you know I you made the comment CDMA is you know kind of dead um, for us to be able to it's think, not it's, not, it's, not growing. Growing. it's not growing, it's not going down. But um, for us to be able to get um, the devices we needed, um, it was a must for us to go to, to go that route. Um, there's no way um, that I would have been able to, to negotiate the iPhone deal with Apple um, if I hadn't went CDMA. And you know, on March 15th, we launched the iPhone. So it, it was critical for us to move to move that way. Um, you know, right now, things are going great. Um, you know, it's a long-term deal, and things are going great. So uh, we're happy that we got into it. Um, uh, we're finding out they're a good partner to work with right now, um, and I hope it stays that way. So, Well, if I'm not mistaken, you're kind of a role model for them. So they, they need somebody to be out talking favorably about their program, and, and you're doing a pretty good job of that, right? Uh, yeah. Good. All right, perfect. Uh, last call. Anybody have a question? Yes. Cool. Let's go. Thank you, guys. Thank you.